Hi, Akiko. So there were a lot of questions uh, and uh, we, I think you have been able to answer about 10 questions earlier during the talk. Mm -hmm. uh, I will be asking you a few more questions that had been shared by many of the viewers and participants from the listen study. So the first question that I have today is, so not finding autoantibodies, especially means that it appears as though long COVID is not an autoimmune disease. Are long haulers considered immune compromised? Yeah, so uh, let me be clear about what we actually found. We um, found using the rapid accelerator antigen profiling uh, developed by Dr. Ring's lab uh, that autoantibodies against extracellular proteins or secreted proteins from humans were not enriched in long COVID. So uh, we haven't specifically started to look at intracellular antigens. Um, however, as you have done, Bornali, um, we have also unpublished data that demonstrate that there really isn't a striking difference in lupus-related autoantibodies at the time point that we are looking at, which is well over a year after infection. So this means that it, it doesn't look like a typical autoimmune disease to us. Um, it may have, uh, for instance, an involvement of T cells, which we have not uh, examined yet. So I don't want to rule out T cell mediated autoimmunity as a possibility. However, um, we, we are not, we don't have any concrete evidence um, that supports autoimmunity at this point. It is possible though, that down the road, years from now, some people may have a, an increased risk of developing autoimmunity, uh, just like what's been shown for uh, multiple sclerosis and EBV. So, um, I don't want to rule out a, a link in the future, but currently we're not really seeing a, a very strong signal for autoimmunity. Okay, I'll move on to the next question. The next question is, will those of us with PEG allergy be able to use the nasal vaccine you have developed? Oh, right. So the nasal vaccine we have developed um, is a booster, uh, nasal booster strategy. So um, how it works is we uh, leverage the existing immune responses developed by the mRNA vaccines um, and by inoculating, spraying um, the recombinant spike protein uh, into the nose. And that establishes uh, robust antibody anti-cell immunity in the nose, uh, throat, and the lung um, of these animals. It's, it's only preclinical right now. We're trying to raise funds to be able to do this in human clinical trial. We haven't done that yet. However, when it becomes available, I don't think there's any problem with um, people with PEG allergy because the recombinant spike protein uh, contains no PEG. It's just a, a simple purified protein, no adjuvants, no formulations. So I think that that would be a safe thing to use for people with PEG allergy. Okay, the next question is related to cortisol. So people are asking, what is happening with ACTH levels then? Right, so um, our data show that even though the cortisol level is about half of that of healthy control in the long COVID patients, uh, the ACTH, which is a hormone secreted by the pituitary gland, is not elevated, meaning that normally uh, a low level of cortisol should be countered by increasing ACTH level uh, to elevate the cortisol level from the adrenal gland. And that is not what we're seeing. And so we suspect that there might be defect within the pituitary or the hypothalamus, which kind of tells the pituitary glands to make the ACTH. Maybe these central axes are uh, not working properly in the long COVID patients. So what Dr. Petrino's uh, group is doing is to look at MRI from these um, my long COVID participants to see if there's any defect that they can pick up in the central nervous system that might explain this uh, cortisol reduction. The next question then, it's related to the study that we are doing. So. It says, the person asks, I have already joined and completed the initial survey. Are we able to participate in a study in which they are looking for things like cytokines, cortisol, et cetera? Right, so uh, the LISTEN study is uh, currently collecting all the surveys from all of the participants. 
which is really important. That's what uh, um, allowed us to look at um, the demographics and symptoms um, in people with long COVID versus post-vaccine long haul and so on. Um, and in the future, in a very near future, <laughs> we will be uh, asking some of the participants to participate in research study where we are going to be looking at um, all the different parameters that we've studied in the my long COVID study, including um, cytokines, antibodies, um, and then cortisol levels, and um, many other features that we are currently looking into. So um, yes, some of the lesson participants will be contacted to see if, if they also want to provide uh, blood samples or saliva. So this is another question from an interested participant. Very much agree with the urgency for vaccine complications. So much information coming out from everywhere on long COVID, but Yale Listen is the only major institution even mentioning vaccine effects. Can you increase profile of vaccine complication research since you're the only one doing it? It's hard to maintain pro-vaccine stance in the absence of etiology or therapeutics. Very hesitantly got the booster, but I'm quite worried that I'm an idiot to continue to get boosters. Oh, well, this is, um, I, I, yeah, I, I'm sorry that you're suffering from this and um, I hope you did not suffer any um, um, post booster effect. Uh, so the, currently it's frustrating that we don't even understand uh, what to recommend to people who have uh, long COVID or post vaccine issues, uh, whether they the, the boosters are gonna be safe uh, and what percentage of the people are going to um, have a similar kind of uh, symptoms that they experience with other shots. So uh, without having uh, um, the, the data, to support one way or the other. Um, boosters are obviously very important for providing protection from severe disease uh, from the current Omicron um, pandemic that's going on. And so you're not at all an idiot to, to get the booster. Um, and I, I really hope you didn't suffer uh, any consequences um, that are um, more than just um, um, uh, regular react uh, reactogenicities. Um, so yeah, this is a very important question. And, and uh, as I mentioned earlier in my other um, responses, it, it, you know, the vaccine, um, post-vaccine syndrome that, that we are seeing here in the Yale Lesson study and, and elsewhere in the world um, hasn't been uh, studied rigorously. And that's what we're trying to do with the Yale Lesson. And uh, to elevate the profile, um, I think the best way to elevate the profile is actually doing the study and demonstrating biological um, factors that correlate with uh, uh, vaccine-related adverse events. Um, that way we can understand the underlying etiology of that disease and whether that's related to long COVID and uh, ultimately the driver of, of those diseases. Um, so we are hoping that through doing rigorous studies that we will be able to highlight and elevate the importance of doing such a study. And that's why um, at Yale Lesson, we are dedicated to figuring out um, both kinds of uh, diseases at the same time. So uh, here's a question about the viral genome. Do we know if there has been a study that analyzed full genome of virus indicating replicating competent virus? Okay, so I think this uh, question uh, pertains to the viral reservoir or, um, okay. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know of uh, any studies that have um, test looked at the sequences of the viral genome that's within these tissues. Uh, that's a very important uh, question and very important uh, research endeavor to actually do. Uh, because right now we don't know whether the uh, bits of RNA that people are detecting from uh, intestinal biopsies, for example, whether they represent fully uh, replication competent virus or some defective, um, you know, particle or just um, segments of the genome that remain somehow in different compartments within the cell. So this is a very important question that um, needs to be addressed. I, I haven't seen much studies on that yet. Here is a question about mitochondrial damage. 
So the participant is asking how much focus is being placed on mitochondrial damage related to vaccine injury and viral induced long haul or long COVID. Right. Um, so one of the, the key physiological defects that are, have been reported for at least long COVID um, is that uh, oxygen utilization by tissue is uh, quite impaired, meaning that even though there's circulating oxygen levels in the blood, that blood, uh, blood oxygen isn't being properly utilized by the tissue, like the muscles and other areas um, that we all need. Um, every cell in the body needs oxygen. Um, whether that stems from mitochondrial defect, mitochondrial damage, or whether it stems from vascular uh, defect um, or microclots or some other issues, uh, we don't quite understand yet. Um, there is um, plenty of evidence for um, platelet activation and um, microclot formation and um, vascular um, damage in long COVID, uh, patients, and, and that could certainly result in the uh, reduced use of oxygen by the tissue. So uh, whether the defect is upstream of mitochondria or within the mitochondria or downstream of mitochondria, we don't quite understand well. Uh, our team is also looking into this um, by looking at morphology of the mitochondria. We are collaborating with an expert, um, Dr. Thomas Horvath at Yale University, who looks at this uh, using electron microscopy. Um, and we're also measuring the function of mitochondria from uh, people with long COVID. Um, and obviously, once the Yale Listen study it, it launches, we would love to do the same for uh, vaccine-related adverse event um, people with, with that as well. Thank you. Here is a participant who wants to know a little more about post-vaccination syndromes. Uh, this participant first congratulates you for your amazing work. And then the question is, post-vaccination syndromes have never formally been studied, even though we have seen them for HPV vaccines. Have you looked into G protein coupled receptor antibodies, which have been identified in patients with POTS or dysautonomia, long COVID, and MECFS? Mm. Right. So, uh, because we have the fortune of collaborating with Dr. Aaron Ring's lab, who has um, multiple uh, GPCRs included in the REAP, we are able to detect if there are any uh, of autoantibodies against GPCRs. And, um, you know, we are seeing, I mean, so even healthy people um, ha have multiple autoantibodies that, that don't really cause any diseases. Uh, so it's very important to understand how different are these anti-GPCR antibodies in a disease group compared to the healthy control. And so far, um, studies that the, the questioner is referring to hasn't done that, hasn't really compared um, POTS versus healthy controls and so on. And there is a study that, that has compared anti-GPCR antibody levels in POTS versus healthy control, and they haven't found any differences in the level or the intensity. So we have to be cautious, like every study uh, needs to be looked at with, this, uh, with the eye of whether there has been a uh, proper control group included. And if not, we need to be able to do that in the future. Otherwise, uh, we may be, um, you know, uh, focusing on antibody, autoantibodies that are not at all pathologic. Um, as I mentioned, all of us carry lots of autoantibodies that don't do anything. So let's just be cautious about that uh, to, to do a proper study with the right controls and then see if um, there are specific autoantibodies that are coming up. So far with our myelon COVID, we are not seeing uh, specific anti-GPCR antibodies that are enriched in long COVID patients. Thank you, Akiko. So the next question is from a participant who says, so we are still identifying characteristics of long COVID and there is no focus on pathology. So that's the question. Oh. Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, the participant is a little upset that we are still identifying um, characteristics of long COVID without focusing on the pathology so far. Oh, I see. Um, 
Well, that's what we're trying to focus on uh, with our own studies. Um, it's to look at the, what is the pathology and more specifically, what is the pathogenesis of this disease? Which means what are the molecular triggers that ultimately results in the defects that are being detected uh, in the patients with long COVID or uh, vaccine related adverse events? So, for instance, the um, vascular damage and things like that are downstream of something that happens as a result of the infection. We want to connect the dots between the infection all the way to the pathology that's being detected in these patients. So without that line, it's very difficult to intervene with this process, right? So if we want to give the um, most promising therapy for people who are suffering from these diseases, we really need to know the driver. And in order to understand the driver, you need to um, just deeply profile these people. And, and that's what the whole purpose of Yale Listen study is. Thank you, Akiko. So this brings me to the last question that I have on my list. So the last question is about EBV reactivation. The question is, could the EBV or other latent viruses, reactivation of which be mainly due to the overall TH1 to TH2 shift? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to know why uh, EBV reactivation is occurring in a subset of long haulers. Um, there are many theories. We don't have a, a real answer yet, but uh, many um, sort of triggers can cause uh, reactivation of these latent viruses. Uh, one of which is um, defect in T cell surveillance of these uh, viral latent viruses. Uh, and that may be what's happening uh, in these people. So Jim Heath's group uh, has shown nicely looking at the uh, longitudinal study from uh, the time of uh, COVID infection to three months post um, COVID infection, uh, that there is this, um, er, uh, uh, the viremia that occurs as a result of EVB reactivation happens in uh, a subset of people who, who then go on to develop long COVID. So it's one of the four risk factors for developing long COVID uh, that you can look at during the acute phase. So that to me suggests that this EBV latency is somehow broken uh, or, or, or like allowing to become reactivated as a result of the acute infection phase. And um, that could be because of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus's impact on T cells or um, surveillance by the T cells uh, that is uh, enabling these um, like latent viruses to become activated. There could be other reasons. Uh, and uh, one of the, uh, my graduate students is actually looking at why this might happen uh, using a variety of different models. Um, right now, we don't know how the EBV reactivated and what the consequences of that is. So it's a very important question, but we have very little data on that. Okay, cool. These were the questions that I had on my list. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Bernali.